Thank you for listening to the Fantasy Writers Toolshed. If you'd like to join our writing community on Discord and get access to fantasy writing classes and books on Patreon, check the links in the description. And if you don't want to miss any future episodes, be sure to follow or subscribe. And to support the show, leave a quick rating on Spotify or iTunes and share this episode on social media or with anyone who you think may be interested. Thank you very much for listening. Enjoy the show. Thank you for listening to the Fantasy Writers Toolshed. I'm your host, Richie Billing, and today I'm delighted to be joined by author Gabriella Houston. Gabriella, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, we briefly met at FantasyCon last year, put the book here. Second row. Oh, second row here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, you had another book that came out last year, late last year, wasn't it? Um, yes, The Bone, Bone Roots. Mm-hmm. So... Again, Slavic folklore inspired. <laughs> Very good. It's uh, it's really interesting. Like what what I've been enjoying most about the book is the Slavic influence, but it's it's not something you see a lot. Um, really refreshing. No. Um, and there's a lot to learn from, especially like the folklore, isn't there? Um, yes, for sure. <laughs> so it seems to be like a massive influence in in your writing. So let's start at the beginning. Like, so give us a bit of an idea about you your upbringing and um like how you got into slavic folklore and how it's Um, influenced your writing so i'm a slav myself so i'm polish uh and uh i came to the uk at 19 to study english literature um but yeah when it comes to slavic folklore it's really interesting because i you know obviously like most children in poland like i would read like folkloric stories for children like little picture books uh, by english standards extremely dark picture books about <laughs> like the ghost of a drowned man that is trying to find a wife by drowning a random village girl <laughs> uh, but it's a very sad story he is not successful in the end um so i remember vividly all those stories from my childhood but then there is no real in-between space between the picture books and the, you know, books for adults to sort of uh, about explore it in a more kind of technical way. There might be more coming, more coming out now, but there certainly were none aware when I was growing up. So I went from those like Slavic picture books to reading about other world mythologies and, you know, like <laughs> I say world mythology is mostly focusing on like Greek mythology and Norse mythology, you know, with with a smattering of Egyptian and and Japanese, Chinese. But, uh, you know, by and large, we sort of moved away from the Slavic area. And then uh, as an adult, I came back to Slavic mythology with fresh eyes. And I'm actually really glad for having that comparison because... I think when you read widely and you read about different cultures and different folklores, you know, like you you sort of, you start to glean very different value systems, uh, very different rules uh, to do with community, to do with, uh, you know, relationships, uh, how people viewed their place in the world. And just comparatively, it's, it's it's just a fascinating thing to see. And, and and you see links now to even with sort of Christianity in between, um, yeah. you sometimes see uh, kind of leftover traditions in, in modern day. Yeah, because I suppose that's why it's, it's, it serves a similar function, like like religion would serve like a, as a way of trying to explain the, the workings of the world. Like if you hear or see something weird and, in the woods and you have no comprehension of what it could be you've got to try and explain it yourself on a psychological level to try and come to terms with it or come to yeah. peace with it haven't you so i mean that's where a lot of these things come from and it's it's really interesting to to get the slavic perspective because i say it's not something that gets discussed a lot in in western um mainstream fiction um, and i've i've been enjoying the striga in <laughs> um the, the second bell so is that that i'm guessing they come from Polish strigas Polish. yeah so strigas in um 
So in the, the second, so the, the bone roots has a lot more different types of Slavic uh, creatures and the different types of Slavic traditions. The yeah. second bell, I kind of, I drew on that and I drew on the, those kind of value systems, but I slightly subverted the, the, the mythology. So in most of, um, you know, in, in, in Slavic stories, um, Sugar was just a straightforward monster. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, a sugar was born, you know, some, so, you know, a child was born with like two sets of teeth and two hearts, for example, or, uh, or it was a curse that was put upon a young girl, usually. And um, I remember reading a version of the story because in a lot of, it's very hard to distinguish which uh, which folkloric stories you're reading now have been um, maybe excessively influenced by the sort of advent of Christianity and which ones sort of retain some of the old value systems. Yeah. But in the Striga story, it's really interesting because in a lot of, of sort of more modern retellings, Striga is killed. But in the, uh, I remember reading this one version where the hero of the story comes in and sort of crawls in her tomb. And the way that he breaks the spell is because he kind of takes on to himself her pain and he's, he understands her loneliness and her um, and, and, and what she suffered. And sort of that act of empathy and true understanding is what is the thing that breaks the spell rather than just taking away her resting place yeah really and cool. and so i kind of subverted that a little bit and, and and used that sort of empathy um model in the second bell um because you know there are sugars and they're feared but they're not necessarily how people view them yeah yeah that's amazing it's um i, I tell you mean it's just like you, you've got something that you're familiar with and then you creatively put that spin on it and um, just to, to find something unique and and uh, original it's uh it's great so tell us about the bone roots then and the kind of things that you find in there so the bone roots like in uh so the second belt is a story about mothers and daughters really whereas uh the bone roots is very much focused on the two mother protagonists and um, the premise of a story is uh, 15 years before the story starts, those two women pluck their baby daughters from the child growing tree of goddess Zemya. And 15 years later, one of the children is missing. It was uh, kidnapped as a baby by the fox thief, the sort of elusive, monstrous sort of being that um, everybody fears. Yeah. And the other child is uh, is almost grown. You know, she's she's fifteen, and her mother lives in constant fear. And then you sort of sort of start to see that the daughter is uh, is changing herself. And so, the, and then you have the, those two mothers sort of brought together, and only one of them can succeed in in keeping her child safe, and only one of them knows why. So you have like you know mystery element, but they, this is much more steeped in the kind of they they live in a world that is sort of infused with with all of those different sort of Slavic tales and different Slavic creatures that live alongside us. And I really like that in sort of Slavic uh, mythology and Slavic folklore, this element of uh, respect that we live alongside the creatures of the spirit world and we have mm -hmm. to uh follow the rules and we have to understand the rules and um and and sort of that is how we can stay safe yeah no, that's really cool it's like um like i, I i'm always interested by the bigfoot stories and i particularly <laughs> love the native perspective because it's been a massive part of their culture for so long and it, for them, it's like all about respect um and it's like accepting and trying to understand Every, everything's place in the world. Um, yeah. 
And it, yeah, when you were talking about that, then like I think the way you're trying to find that sort of understanding, it's storytelling so powerful, isn't it? As as a vehicle for it is helping people see and these things. Yeah, I think when it comes to you know myth- when we're talking about mythologies um, and sort of religions, those are but just tend to be very high above us and high above the ordinary people, you know. So you might do something to uh, appease Pedon and you might do, you know, like carry on festivities uh, in the name of another goddess. But between all of that, there is the space that is close to us and that space is filled with things we don't understand as well. And so what I love about folklore is this... um, this goes for like mundane, the mundane is not mundane. Like that there is so much to be found and there's so much richness in the details and that, you know, you can have a, a, a banyik, you know, you can, you can have a creature that the, 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 his only role is to live in a bathhouse and like, yeah. you know, he will like for a crust of bread, he'll keep your bath warm, you know, and like, you know, <laughs> keep rats away or whatever. So, and and then you have creatures that um, are completely separate from us and they don't care one way or another about us. And that to me is very beautiful as well because this idea that there is, there is a world beyond us. I think yeah. a lot of religions sort of, uh, sort of the Abrahamic religions for, for certain sort of seem to strip that away this idea that there is a world that is of value beyond humans and I, I what I love about folklore is this sort of focus on like well we are just living here we're just like you know taking this small part of the world and when we go into the part that does not belong to us we need to act accordingly yeah that's good cool. Awesome. It's a great way to put it. So can you keep us a bit of an idea of your writing process? Is it like a, do you follow like a, a bit of a, a routine when you're writing a novel or do you sort of see where it goes? So there's a method to my madness, but <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, um, so the one thing that I think, you know, many writers will, will surely tell you or have told you already is that, every single person who writes will have a different method because our brains work in very different ways. Yeah. Um, the one thing that I really personally benefit from is having uh, writing buddies. So I have two, two of my best friends uh, live quite close to, uh, to, to where I live and we try to meet up for writing sessions as well. So obviously you know, sometimes life gets away from us and I just have to write alone. Yeah. But it's it's really nice to sort of meet at the library or at the cafe and just sort of, you know, write together. So that is actually, even though that has nothing to do with craft yet, like we haven't even got into the craft, yeah. but that is so important to me to have that community because, you know, in the kind of, when we take like five minutes breaks, like, you know, the Pomodoro method, 25 minutes writing, five minute break. Like we can still chat through if there's any difficult bits, you know, things you don't understand or something pops into your head and you can talk it through. And that is so yeah. valuable. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the writing itself, like I tend to um, start with a pretty vague concept. Like sometimes it's, and it can be something that is not, does not sound either original or particularly, you know, groundbreaking at all. It's, it, it it can be um, like with the bone roots, I had this image in my head of a fox next to a childbearing tree and literally, and like I wrote something which was like more like a little poem almost. Yeah. And that was my hook for myself, like a description of my book, right? Like it actually, the final product was very far away from it, but it got me in the, in that mood and that's in that space for the atmosphere that the book required because every book is different will have slightly different you know atmosphere it will have different um 
different pacing, different, um, you know, di different sort of levels of tension. So that starting point was very tense. And I knew that this book would have to have like very high tension yeah. built up into it because it's a mystery. And like, uh, you know, the way I've constructed it, it's like, you know, it's it's quite sort of slow development. So there's things obviously happening in, in throughout the book, but all the things come to a conclusion at the end because it ha that is that mystery element. Um, so I knew that was going to be the way I was going to construct it from the start. Uh, but usually what I do is I just start with the character and like they can be doing something quite mundane or they can be at a time like, so in the second bell, we start with a mother that is basically being cast out from her town with her baby. And that is like, you know, gives both a reader and myself an idea of what this book is. Yeah. And I follow the character and it's, I'm not a plotter, as they call it. Like, I don't plan the whole book ahead of writing it. It sounds insane to me because I don't know the characters yet. <laughs> yeah, so, it's true, because they shoot the story, don't they? Yeah, so, you know, I, I also know people who will, like, write a book, like, bare-bone book, and then just add, like, a add the missing bits later on. I can't really do that. Like, and for example, if I am fixing something really big in the novel, I have to fix it straight away yeah. be before I move forward. Not, not proper editing, but like fixing big structural things. If, for yeah. example, a king is now a noble man, I need to switch. I need to do it immediately because that will affect everything going forward. And I'm just like, I have to have that foundation. And then I'm like building on it. Yeah. So so that is my structure. And then the kind of rest of the plot of the book reveals to myself about a third of the way in, usually. Nice. So would you have a, an idea of the end point or what the character wants to achieve? So, I mean, what they want to achieve should be pretty clear to everybody straight yeah. off, right? And it doesn't have to be very specific in terms of how they want to achieve it. But, you know, so in the, in the second bell, we have a mother who leaves with her baby, right? And so the main point is like, you know, she wants to keep her baby safe, yeah. right? And then 19 years later, uh, Salka grows up and, and does her own thing. <laughs> but, um, but that is the starting point. And like with in the bone roots as well, like you have the first scene is one of the mothers, Kada, is bleeding on the ground to give payment to goddess Zemia for the gift of her daughter. And she, we get told like she does it every year. And, you know, she is following the protocol that she understands. But you understand like this is a mother that will bleed for her child. Yeah, yeah. And so everything else she does, you already have that in your head, that, that this mother will bleed for her daughter. Yeah. It's a very good way to approach it. Is that a sort of thing, the way that you use when you come up with any character, like work out what the biggest motivation is? I, you know, of course, like, you know, we, we have to, when, when we're selling the book, we are talking about like the stakes of this and that. Um, I think a lot of it comes from who characters are. So obviously different writers will have a different uh, perspective on that. And you have a lot of people who are more, you know, plotters, as we call it. Like, so they plan the whole book ahead and they're very plot oriented. So what happens in the book is dictated by the big events that they have planned out. Yeah. So my books tend to be very intimate and they're very character focused and character led. So mm -hmm. it's more about who is this person and what does this person want? And then the kind of, um, that is the driving force behind the plot. Yeah, uh, that makes sense to me. I like that approach as well. 
it just makes sense. Um, but obviously everyone everyone approaches things differently, so whatever works for you. Yeah, I mean, you know, it might work differently, you know, if you're trying to plan a book, like an epic story of an empire, right? The, the rise and fall of an empire, then the empire is your main character in many ways. Like you have to plan it in a way that makes sense historically, that makes sense politically. And that, is, but that is for a complete, that makes a completely different type of book. Yeah. No, yeah exactly right there. Yeah. How do you approach uh, world building and setting creation? So I am very focused on like trying to access like all the senses as much as possible. So like I said, like my, my books are very intimate. And so I like to sort of think at all times, what are my characters smelling? What, you know, what are they touching? What's the texture of the things they're touching? How do things sound under their feet? And sometimes it's, you know, and especially when you're at a point in the plot, when you're doing something very big, yeah. so you have a fight scene, right? Or you have, um, uh, or you have like the, the big showdown where the like political leaders of a community are arguing, whatever. I, what I find personally very um, effective is in terms of building atmosphere is to suddenly zoom in. And so um, when you just have dialogue, right, if you don't have um, a lot of, you know, if you don't weave in description of what's happening, you end up with this, um, I think someone called it like talking head syndrome, where mm -hmm. the reader's stops seeing in their head the characters they start just having this like it, it, it's almost like two brains sort of transmitting to each other yeah um so you have to sometimes sort of zoom in on the small details so the uh you know because the, the, char the character exists in their own body in the scene as well yeah and they might they are aware of their body and they're aware of their surroundings and sometimes bringing attention to that it really helps to ground a scene yeah like um sometimes like you, if you listen to someone talk you might just get like uh, a scent like a tingling sensation just off what we say mm. um and like smell like say senses are so powerful so it's a really great approach to take just to like and I think there's a, with your world building as well. There's a lot of research behind it as well. That is interesting. Mm -hmm. So um I w uh, I was at an event with um a representative of uh the Empathy Lab, which mm -hmm. is uh, a UK charity and which uh seeks to promote reading as a method for developing empathy. Okay. Oh, cool. And um uh, there's neurological research that shows that uh when how empathy works in motion <laughs> so in the brain so if you have two people who are um uh, you know their, their brains being are being scanned at the same time and one person smells cinnamon and the other person reads the word cinnamon the same parts of the brain light up so the person reading the word cinnamon is essentially experiencing <laughs> Cinnamon. Yeah. In 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 a in a very real sense, because you know, this is how our brains are, are processed. So, you know, it's and we can build that ability as well through reading, which is yeah. interesting. So the more you read, the more real it all seems. Nice. There you go. Getting very scientific now. <laughs> I love to throw in a little bit of neuroscience and then why not? <laughs> Definitely, yeah. I think all that is it. I mean, I love chatting with psychologists and sociologists as well because all these little things help build your understanding of like people, characters, and understand what you read as want and respond to as well. It's, it's really important. The lot that goes into writing. <laughs> uh, one question I always like to ask uh, authors when they come on is what is the biggest challenge 
that you've encountered in your career and how did you overcome it? Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the thing that people don't talk about very much is that um, you, when you are a mid-list offer, so you have the, the top list offers, right? And then you are a mid-list offer, uh, which is basically everyone else. Anyone who is not like, you know, Stephen King or selling in six digits yeah. um, is, uh, is a mid-list offer. And the reason why so many people drop off the edge of the world, as it seems, uh, after having three books published, say, is because it's not guaranteed that you will sell the next project to a publisher. So I, um, <laughs> you know, so so that is really, that was quite difficult, like emotionally to sort of uh, process that you might not be able to sell all your projects, but rejection is a constant in this industry. And sometimes, you know, like, uh, so my children's duology, you know, the, the wind child, has uh has sold to Euclid and uh Euclid publishing. But before that I, I did have a few rejections that were basically like we we love this, but we already have something Slavic on the book. So you don't need we don't need any more. <laughs> so sometimes it's just time and isn't it things like that. And that all comes down to luck. Mm. Just like yeah, there's a big element of that and yeah. So um, I think it's you know the kind of understanding that you know you just have to persevere and like you can't um you know you can't can't control other people you can't control um you know how the industry works you can just you know control what you're going to do with it <laughs> in the beginning of may um i'm going me and a lot of other offers are launching a kickstarter because i so i i do line of cut printing right nice. And uh, a friend of mine asked if she could do a story based on one of my illustrations about like loosely based off Anansi Smith. And um, I thought, well, let's think bigger. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I actually know a lot of offers. And so I reached out to, you know, um, a couple dozen offers. And within like two days, I had like 20 odd people saying they wanted to be a part of it. Oh, nice. So... So we're going to be launching Kickstarter probably in May, maybe early May, um, for, uh, for for an anthology of fully illustrated anthology uh, of world folklore. That's going to be amazing. So yeah, but it's like you know, it's I'm in the era of making my own opportunities as well because mm -hmm. published traditional publishing works really slowly. I know more and more uh, offers who are. You could say well established. They have quite a few books out there, <clears throat> and they are experimenting with sort of hybrid publishing as well. So they're experimenting with self publishing because you know maybe they write more than one book a year, <laughs> and yeah. and publishing doesn't seem to be able to absorb that. You know, yeah. if you sell a book, it will come out in two years. Yeah. So. Um, there is a space in between where, you know, you want to, and, and when you're establishing an audience, people are expecting yearly turnout of something yeah. at least. Right? right. So. I honestly think it's a good, the best way to go is to try and do hybrid because you get the best of both worlds. Then you get a bit of the support and the more structured marketing and the network that comes with like the traditional side. And yeah. then at the end of the day, it's the readers that keep you in a job and if you I mean, can connect with them and yeah and, and, it all depends on the individual i would say because yeah. it's it's not suited for everybody and no. it's um it's very time consuming oh yeah and you know it requires some resources as well Definitely. um to you know to, to to actually sort of promote successfully because unless you can churn out books every two months um you know, and then you can rely on a massive backlist. <clears throat> it's, um, you know, you have to be able to promote those books as well. So it's, um, 
when people talk about like you know wanting to self-publish i'm just like you know that's great but there are like four thousand books in the english language that are coming out every day how are you going to differentiate yourself because if you know they need to have something in their mind that they're going to do how they're going to approach it yeah so it's like you know so yeah like a lot of people that i know that have been like established in, in traditional publishing for a while are thinking of going hybrid or have already done so. Um, but I always tell people like marketing and writing are two separate skill sets. So you need to make sure to yeah. develop both. And before you sink a lot of time into the marketing, um, this is the problem I've always had is because I decided there, you know, I wanted to try a bit of a hybrid thing. And then I've just invested a lot of time in marketing. Um, but this podcast will be on one thing. Um, mm-hmm. And websites, another one. Snick loads, loads of time into that. Um, you try different things, like you try social media, that doesn't really work. Um, and you've got to see what does work and then make that part of your overall strategy. So, yeah. That's a, uh, but it is, it's, it's span the balance between everything because if you do too much of one thing, then you're not going to do any writing. And that's what you read as once at the end of the day you can have a mailing list of 10,000 people but if you're not really producing any written content so absolutely and I think for when we're talking about challenges in in publishing I think like it was a big challenge for me to realize that and I am very proactive as a like to begin with I was always like you know publicity meetings I'm coming prepared I have like a list of things I could do or whatnot but I did not anticipate just how much how many different skill sets I'm required to acquire yeah alongside being an offer like I thought that well an offer writes books and well publishers mostly do the promoting yeah. right uh and it is true for the very big offers who you know will you will see getting posters on the london underground or whatever but um but for most offers you are required to do a lot of publicity and then you know there's other stuff like i did not know if i signed up to be a website coder but you know google yeah. changes its terms and conditions and suddenly i have to actually engage with what c name is Oh, yeah. you know and, and and google all that stuff to to actually code <laughs> in so it works yeah it is it that is a pain i mean seo that's what i do with a day job so i got quite lucky that i was able to apply to writing stuff um, that's a great skill set to have yeah so i mean like it's the difference between having a website that gets a thousand visits a year and one hundred and fifty thousand visits a year so you can mm-hmm. tie that in with your email lists and all things like that to help promote you can writing. i interview you next because <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. have all kinds of skill sets that are extremely useful yeah it's just the marketing side and it's it's something that has taken a very very long time to get your head around like email marketing took years to sort that out um and these are the challenges that you're up against aren't you? and there's only so many hours in the day so what, yes. can you, what can you do? Just stop sleeping. <laughs> yes. It is it's, tough. And it's like that with everything, especially with uh, social media. Like I saw <clears throat> two different videos today um, on reels, like one woman doing like DIY around her house. And it looks fantastic. And I feel like I bet I could do that if I had... Yeah, I don't know, five months, three, and like a lot of heavy machinery that I could just easily <laughs> access. Um, but realistically, that is not high on my priority list. And then like there is a, a man who cooks the most delightful meals. Each one takes like six hours. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you feel like, well, that looks great, but it's it's not even like a skill set. It's just time. Uh, like yeah. we are, we are all sure so short on time. I know, and I was I did a survey recently, which was just looking at challenges that writers were facing. Because I was basically convinced that AI was was going to have more of an impact 
but surprisingly, I think it was like 70% of people said that AI had really impacted them. Um, but one thing that did and does and still is is the cost of living crisis because now people are having to work two jobs, mm. maybe three jobs, you never know, just to like keep up. Yeah. And I mean, I work two jobs, basically. So it's, and it's just, it, the more you have to work, the less writing time you get. It's like writing it's time is the luxury. Yeah. It's like but, a measure of how, how good your life is, is how much writing time you get. <laughs> I mean, publishing has a huge accessibility issue. Yeah, this, uh, is the this is a massive problem. And I mean, I was saying to you before that I didn't really like fantasy time last time around. And it's because when I was, I'm, I'm from a very working class background. I was raised by a single mother. Uh, we didn't have anything, you know what I mean? So, I'm going to fantasy con, grammar schools, private schools, everything like that. Um, oh, okay. You know what I mean? It's just, it's not, they're not the voices that I can relate to. You mm. get me? And yes, for sure. Yeah. And and it's nice that where when people actually talk about it a bit more, I interviewed uh, this children's author, uh, Emma Finlayson Palmer, who also runs the Twitter event, uh, UK Teen Pat Chat. And uh, she always sort of emphasizes um, that she's a working class offer. And I think it's really nice to have that representation because yeah. I think a lot of people feel like they just can't access it. And I mean, from practical reasons, it might be very difficult to access it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, the publishing itself, when you look at the, the people who work in publishing and um I remember I spoke to this bookseller once and and she 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 sort of worked with a lot of publishing people and and, and she said that um forgettable Katie's and uh vanishing Amanda, as she called them. <laughs> it's like basically all those random young women usually, um, you know, upper middle class white women who get random jobs. In uh, in different publishing houses, and and then you find out that they're all like the niece of so and so or the cousin of so and so. So there is actually like a lot of nepotism in publishing. Yeah. So so when we're talking representation and all sort of ways that can work, it's 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 quite difficult because you know the uh, publishing jobs themselves they pay so little. Yeah. Until you're like, at, you know, the, the director or whatever. Uh, they pay so little that only people who are already quite wealthy can afford to do them. Yeah. And you've got to somehow survive in expensive places like London. Yeah. So you have to have like either a partner that supports you or you have to be, or, you know, already have like financial sort of safety net. Yeah. And it's very difficult to create... Um, sort of true diversity and um, increase the motivation to bring other people in yeah. when the people who are themselves producing the work and who are, who are themselves in charge um, have, you know, are, are not representative of that. And they have, even with the best intentions, and a lot of people in publishing have the best intentions, but they don't understand yeah. how a lot of things work. So, uh, so then you get, you know, a lot of tokenism, you know, you get a lot of people who are be very vocal on Twitter, but they, like, even with the best intentions, they might just not know how to go about, you know, helping to promote a wider range of people yeah. to, to, to sort of tell their stories. I know. It's a, it's a really interesting subject. Like, I, I really like the working class uh, angle because I think people who come from that background see the world in a very different way. Priorities mm -hmm. are different and the themes are the stories are a lot more interesting. Um, well to me anyway, because that's where I am. But um, there's a an angry robot author, um brilliant writer as well, one of my favorite writers, Daniel Polanski. Um a oh, what, sorry? Daniel Polanski. Um and he wrote a series called Low Town, which it came out a while ago now. Um but that was very sort of gritty urban 
mode fantasy, and he's from Baltimore, uh, which is very similar to Liverpool, where I'm from, and he's from that sort of similar background, and you sort of get the sense of it in his in his writing, and I really loved it. So I'm, I'm hopefully we'll, we'll get him back on the show to talk more oh. about like working class writing. And that'd be that's great. Really I would love to there. listen to that because it's um. It's basically, you know, a completely different, you know, like you say, my, you know, mindset. But like, it's not even about mindset. It's about like different, uh, uh, different differences. You know, it's, but it's very, you know, you can empathize with things and try to imagine them. But it, it's really nice to, to be able to hear from people who actually lived it. Yeah, exactly. And then that's the great thing about podcasts like this is we get to get everyone's perspectives. It's very really- Gabriella, thank you very much. It's been a, a fantastic chat. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. And where, where's the best place to look if anyone would like to learn more about you and your writing? So, and you've got a podcast as well. Yes, yeah, so I have a, a podcast. I'm on YouTube. So on YouTube, the Gabriella Houston Project, uh, where I interview uh, not just writers, but, you know, researchers, people from all walks of life, historians, researchers, you know, doctors, scientists, uh conservation lists um and we talk about how storytelling is an intrinsic part of everyone's life and many many professions yeah um so it's a lot of very interesting people talking about their expertise and um aside from that you can find me i'm on all social media pretty much but i'm also uh, on on my website it's gabriellahouston.com and i've been mostly focusing recently on uh, sending newsletters so I, I send a monthly newsletter with all the news and events and occasional recipe <laughs> and whatnot oh, nice. <laughs> um so uh yeah so that's how people can get in touch brilliant oh well, Gabrielle, thank you very much again uh i thank you everyone at home for listening